Okay, good morning. As we start the uh, chitas of the day, today uh, is the uh, fifth reading in the portion of Mishpatim. We are holding on chapter 23, verse number six. Do not pervert the judgment of your poor man in his lawsuit. Now she says, Evyeneik is expression of oive, meaning one who's impoverished and desires all good things. So you're not allowed to pervert justice to dust because a person is poor. Distance yourself from saying false matter. Don't not say falsity. And do not kill a truly innocent person. He lay at the Russia or one who's declared innocent, for I will not vindicate a guilty person. So now she says, how do we know that if one emerges from court guilty and is given the death sentence, and the one of the judges say, I have a way to prove his innocence, we must bring him back to court and retry him? Because the Torah states, and you, and uh, you, that, and you, and you, you must bring back, because the Torah states, and do not kill, a truly innocent person. Although he was not declared innocent, for he was not vindicated by court, he is nevertheless free from the death penalty because you have reason to acquit him. And therefore, you always have to try to find to acquit somebody. And how do we know that if one merges with the court innocent? And one of the judges say, I have a way to prove his guilt. We do not bring him back to court because the Torah states and do not kill one who is declared innocent. And this is one of the innocents is he's vindicated in court. And that's also in, in civil court. Once a person has been vindicated from justice, you're not going to bring him back to court. Kiliatik Russia, it is not incumbent upon you to return him to court, for I will not vindicate him in my law. If he emerges innocent from your hands and you, from your court, I may, I have many agents to put him to death with the death penalty he deserves. So if you vindicate him, don't worry, I will take care of him. Verse number eight. You're not going to accept the bribe. Because this bribe blinds the, the eye, the blinds the clear sighted. The Isalev Divit Tzadikim and corrupts the word of the right. Shirashi says, what's the, should, the Torah tell you, I'll take a bribe. You're not going to take a bribe. This has come to tell us even in order to judge fairly and surely not to pervert job. Even the guy says, here's money that you should judge righteously. For in fact, taking a bribe in order to pervert judgment is already mentioned. You shall not pervert judgment. But we're talking about the guy tells you, gives you money to, 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 to do the right thing. You have a pikrim, now she says. Even if one is wise in the Torah and accepts a bribe, he will eventually become deranged, forget his studies, and lose his eyesight. The Yisalev, now she says, renders the meaning spoils. Divrei tzaddikim, what means the words of the right? Divrei tzaddikim, words that are just, true judgment. And so are I made the translation is meaning straight things. It, it bends straight things. So you're not allowed to oppress a stranger. You know the pain of a stranger. You were a stranger in the land of in the land of Egypt. So Rashi says, this is important. In many places, the Torah warns about strangers, converts. Because he has stronger temptation to, to return to his former ways. You're not going to put pressure on people that have the capability or the intuition to go to become evil. How hard it is for him when his people oppress him, when he's a gay, whether he's a convert or whether he's a stranger, that we put pressure on them, we treat them unkindly. Verse number 10, for six years you shall sow your land. And gather its produce. Now she says, 
means lahachnis of Abai to bring it into your house. It's your land, and you can bring the fruits. This, this is the law of Shemitah, that in the seventh year, the land of Israel the, it goes free. Shvi in the seventh year, Tishmetanov and Tashta, in the seventh year in the land of Israel, which actually this year is a year of Shemitah in the land of Israel. When Atashta at your land, you should abandon your land. You have no right to touch the land. Everybody has right to the land. Then the, the poor people shall eat. They can go into your land and they can take anything they want. They, uh, the people eat and whatever left over the beast of the field shall It's open to everybody, to animals, to humans. This is an unbelievable mitzvah. Kaitasa lachai mecholadei says, so you should make your vineyards and your old trees. So this is the laws of Shemitah. So Tishmitanim avaydi, and I'll do work the land. When Atashta, you abandon it from eating it after the time of removal. Another interpretation from real work, such as plowing and sowing, and abandon its fertilization and hoeing. The Yitram. And whatever is left over the beast of the field, shalit. this is written in order to liken the food of the poor to the food. It's open to animals and poor people. Just as the beast eats without tithing, so do the poor. The, the field doesn't need any tithing. The field doesn't need any work. You now touch the field. So shall you do to your vineyards. So tell you, uh, at the beginning of the verse, it's speaking of the grain field. As stated above, you sow your land. Verse number 12, six days you may work. In the seventh day, you should rest. On the sixth and the seventh day, also your ox and donkey shall rest. Be enough, fish ben ha and your maidservant son and the stranger shall refresh. The is refreshment. Refresh. Actually says, what's the connection over here between Shemitah and Shabbos? Even in the seventh year, the weekly Shabbos still needs to be there. You might say, I have a whole year of Shabbos. If I'm a farmer, a whole year is Shabbos, the seventh year. Nevertheless, you still have to keep the Shabbos on the seventh day. Commenting because that, that remembers the, the creation of the world should not be uprooted. So you shall not say that since the entire year you refer to Shabbos, the weekly Shabbos need not to be observed. Doesn't make a difference. On Shemitah, you still have to keep the Shabbos. Give it rest to permit it to tear up and eat grass from the earth. Or perhaps the verse means that one must confine it indoors. But you must say that this is confining them indoors would not be rest, but discomfort. So you have to let your animals do whatever they want on Shabbos. Let them walk the fields, let them eat whatever they want. Men Masecha, also your maidservant, the text speaker, an uncircumcised slave, that a, 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 a is also not a lot of work on Shabbos for you. A non-Jew is not allowed to do work for you on Shabbos. Again, it's talking about refers to a resident alien. Verse 11, 13. mighty and everything that I've said aleichem to you, tishmoidu you shall watch. Vishemalikim achedim and other gods leisaskiru do not mention other gods. Leishma picha she not even heard in your mouth. Now she says the meaning is this verse comes to give it a positive commandment. <clears throat> the stringency of a prohibition for every ex uh, uh, a, a negative commandment for every Shemitah beware in the Torah is prohibitive and appears instead of a negative expression so that means that there's a mitzvah in not doing an Aveda and not doing a sin one should not say to another wait for me beside such and such an idol I'll meet you at the corner of the church you know I'll do that the church, an idol, is not allowed to be a marketplace for you. Or meet me on the day of such and such an idol. Meet, I'll meet you on an Xmas. You're not allowed to do that. Another explanation concerning all that is I've said to you. You shall beware. In the name of the gods of the strangers shall not be mentioned 
This comes to teach us that idolatry is tantamount to the commandments, all, all, the, all the commandments combined. And whoever is careful with it is considered as observed all of them. Keeping, not doing idol worship is, and not connecting your speech and your thought to any idol worship is as if, as if you're doing all the Torah. The Yishman are going for the Gentile Apicha. Meaning you should not become partnership with a Gentile so that he swears to you by his pagan deity. That's the problem. He's going to want to also swear by, uh, by an idol. And you shouldn't be involved in that kind of situation. The result, if what does swear, will be that it will directly cause you, the deity, to be mentioned to yourself. Through claiming he made against you. Occasions may arise a gentle partner is required to swear, and sometimes, sometimes to his Jewish partner. And how is he going to swear? Okay, they, they'll, they'll swear by his deity. Today they put everybody the, 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 the hand on the, on the Bible. But if they put it on the New Testament, so he's swearing on a Vedazara, an idol worship. Verse 14. Three times a year, you'll celebrate to me every year. Right? The, hol- the three holidays, major holidays in the Torah, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Ragalim, over here, interesting word, Ragalim is legs, feet. But over here, it's, uh, it is translated as pa'amim, times. Ragalim. Tzchaga Matze is the holiday of Passover, the festival of unleavened bread. Tishma, you shall watch. Shiva shall mantecha matzah for seven days. You shall eat unleavened bread. Kasha tzivicha tzil, as I've commanded. Lameid chayda shaviv. An appointed time in the month of the springtime. Kiva yot mitzayim, because you went out in the springtime. You shall not leave, should not appear before me empty handed. So now she says, the month which the grain fills out the grainness, Baviva, of expression to the word Av, the firstborn, the early of the month, ripened fruits, which is around April time. And that's why we have to we have this year two uh, two others to push Pesach to the Springtime. Pesach always needs to be in the springtime, not in not in winter and not in fall. But layar pani reikam. You talk a little is pani, but I call him. This means when 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 you come to the when you come to celebrate in the Holy Land and come to the Beis Hamidosh, you always have to bring a karba chagiga. You have to bring to me a burnt offering, which called which is a karba chagiga, a a sacrifice to the holiday. Chag HaKotzer, and the festival of the harvest. Bikure Masei, which is the bring of the first, which is the first fruits of your labor. Ashatizu Basada, which you sow in the field. So that's Shavuos. Shavuos is when we bring the first fruits to the Beis HaMikdosh. The Chag HaOsif, and then you have the festival and gathering. That is the Chag HaSukas. So you see, actually, the, all the houses are connected Interesting, we go according to the moon. The Jewish people, the calendar, go according to the moon. But the holidays go according to the sun. Go according to the, go according to the, to the, to the, the way the sun is in the world. The seasons of the sun. Of, of the sun. So uh, we use both calendars in a way. So Pesach is always in the spring. Shavuos is always in the summer. And, uh, and, and Sukkot is always at the end of the summer. So Chaga Kotzer, so so the Shavuos Pesach is Chaga Oviv, the holiday of 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 of, of the spring uh, when it starts to blossom. Chaga Kotzer Shavuos is called the holiday of the of the of the of the, of the, of the cutting, which is when we cut the the, the land. Bikuri Shuz Mana Oviv of Bikuri, which is a time to bring the first fruits for the two breads. Which is brought to Shavuot to serve as a permanent new grain for the meal offering, but to bring the first fruit to the sanctuary. So we we it was a celebration of fruits. The fruits we brought to the sanctuary on on uh, on, on on Shavuot, and uh, so it's connected to fruits of Israel, the Chag Asif, and then the time we gathered the the, the 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 dried out. We dry everything out. After we dry everything out, 
And that is Chag HaSukkot, the holiday of Sukkot. For us, Pachas Maisecha, for during the entire summer, the grain dried in the fields. And the festival of Sukkot, they gathered into the house because of the rains. Because if the Sukkot, on Sukkot, we prayed for the rains. So now, winter is coming. All the, the fields were emptied and brought into your house. So all the holidays, Passover, Shavuos, and Sukkot, are all connected to the harvest. Sholish Pam Bashan on these three holidays of Passover, Shavuos, and Sukkot, there's a mitzvah to go to the Beit HaMikdash. You should come up to the Beit HaMikdash. Now, I said, since the conflict deals with the seventh year, it was necessary to say that the three pilgrimages festivals would not be uprooted from their place. Even on the seventh year, which are seemingly a holiday, a whole year for farmers, but they still had to celebrate Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. Kol Sukhurcha is an obligation on all males to come to the Beis Migdash on Passover, on Sukkot, and on Shavuot. Verse 18. dam zifchi. You shall not sacrifice the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. And the fat of the festival sacrifice shall not stay overnight until morning. As she says, what is the meaning of this verse? You shall not slaughter the Passover sacrifice on the 14th of Nisan until you have done away with leaven. This teaches us an important law that even though Pesach, all holidays start at night, the night before the day, so really Pesach starts on the 15th, the 14th at night, the 15th, which is considered the 15th. But nevertheless, Pesach, since you had to bring the sacrifice of the, of the Passover while it was still the 14th of the month, because you started bringing the sacrifice on the 14th in the middle of the day. So in essence, Pesach starts on the 14th in the middle of the day. And that's why we do it every year, even though we do not bring the sacrifice today. But on the 14th, in the middle of the day, you have to already not have any chametz and everything must be put away. By the 14th middle of the day, every year on Pesach. You're not allowed to leave the fat of sacrifice day overnight off of the altar. It has to be burnt on the altar that night. Adam Baker, one may think that even the altar pry, it would be become disqualified. Different it says, if it's on the pry of the altar all night, as long as it's on the Mizbeach, it's fine. Even though it didn't get consumed that night. Only at dawn is it considered as the fat of the sacrifice is staying overnight. And it says until morning, but all night he may pick the fat up the floor and return it to the altar. So it becomes disqualified in the dawn of the next morning. Verse 19. This is the holiday of Shavuos. The choice is of your first fruits of your soil. You shall bring to the house of the Lord. You shall not cook a kid in the milks of its mother. Now she says, even the seventh year, the offering of the kid is an obligation. Therefore, it stated the first fruits of your soil. How are the kid chosen? A person enters his fields. He sees a fig has ripened. He winds a blade of grass around it as a sign and sanctifies. He says, this fruit I'm going to bring to the base of English. And then he takes lay off when it's ripe, and he takes that fruit, which he gave a sign upon it, and he puts it in a basket, and he gathers all this fruit, whatever he put a sign on it, and he brings it to the base of English. The Kurum are brought as an offering only from the seven species enumerated in the scripture. A land of wheat, barley, vine, figs, pomegranates, a, a, a land yielding olives, and honey of dates. So honey of dates. So there's seven fruits that add to Israel that the land of Israel was blessed with. And that's the mitzvah we do bekurim with. It's specifically, it's not with apples and oranges, but it's with these seven different kinds of vegetation, which is wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. And those are the seven fruits that Israel was blessed with, that Israel was praised with. So here we know the law of not cooking milk and meat together. A calf and a lamb are included in the word gedi. 
for Gedi is only expression of a tender young animal. This you know, you should find in many places in the Torah that Gedi is written, and it was necessary to write the word Izim, qualify as a kid. For example, I will send you Gedi Izim. So Gedi Izim, a kid, Gedi Izim are two kinds, two kids, Gedi Izim Gedaya, to teach us that whatever it says Gedi is mentioned, unqualified, is also means a calf. I mean, whatever it says Gedi without it, without a Gedi Izim, if the Torah wanted to mean that Gedi means a goat, it would have said Gedi Izim. So over here it says, it doesn't say that, it says Leisvashel Gedi. So wherever it doesn't say the word, what it means, it means it means a, 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 any kind of calf or a lamb. The, this prohibition is written three times in the Torah. One for the prohibition of eating meat and milk together. You're not allowed to eat milk and meat together. One is prohibition of deriving any benefits. Once you, milk, you mix, God forbid, milk and meat together, you're now not allowed to have any kind of pleasure from it. And one is the prohibition of cooking milk and meat together. So there's three prohibitions against milk and meat together. One is cooking it, one is eating it, and one is even having any pleasure from it. So that means in Torah law, if God forbid you, if a person mix milk and meat together by mistake, he has to throw it away. He cannot even give it to a dog. He can't give it to a non-Jewish friend. He has to get rid of it. He can't have any hana, any pleasure from milk and meat together, whether it's personal pleasure, somebody not eat it, whether it's giving it to somebody else, I have the pleasure of giving a gift to somebody else, I can not do that with milk and meat together. And that's the law of the Torah, and um, that completes the Chumash of the day. And they're going out to the Tanya of the day, and which we start chapter 25 of Tanya. The Altarebbe, Thus explained very importantly that a Benini, a middleman, is a person that has an animalistic soul, that has all desires in life. He just doesn't do it, right? Because why? Because he realizes that he has a godly soul. And as al Rebbe said, when you realize you have a godly soul, meaning that you have God in you, so if you have God in you, if I have God in me, I realize that the Abishta gave me this challenge. God gave me a challenge. And either I'm going to fall into the challenge. Then the Altar Rebbe says, if God forbid I fell into the challenge, he gave the analogy of taking the king's head and putting it into the toilet. So we should realize that. We shouldn't fool ourselves to think that God, so to say, went away. You know, he just decided, okay, you want to do a sin? Okay, do it on your own. I'll go someplace else. The Abish is right there with you. And he, he when, when I do the sin, he's there. He's stuck with me. And when I, and so you, you're thinking in, stu, in, 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 in a moment of stupidity to think that you're separate from God while you're doing the sin. Doesn't work that way. You're with the Abish the second you're doing the sin. Whatever the sin might be in thought, speech, and action. So now the Alter Rebbe goes back to the original verse, which he based the whole Tanya on. The verse sets in Deuteronomy. God, Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish nation. God says to the Jewish nation. What I'm asking you to do is very close to you. I'm not asking you the impossible. Everything that I'm asking you is very easy. It's something that is in your is, is in your reach. I'm not asking you to do the, to jump over loops which you cannot do. Why? So the question is why? And the answer is because we have a godly soul and we have free choice. We have a godly soul and we have free choice and we have a brain in our heads. So that's what the Rebbe says. This is the meaning of, so that's why the verse says the Torah and the mitzvahs are very close to you. If you know what free choice is, then every moment, every moment, 
of a human being has free choice. It's in his domain. Every person has a free choice to go away from stupidity. That's a free choice. You wanna you wanna act like a clown, But every Jew has the capability to open his mind, to learn the Torah, to learn the truth, and do the truth. Nobody can stop him. Only himself. So that's why every person has that free choice. The forgetfulness. Oh, I forgot God. God's not here. I I have that free choice to, to say that. And just like I have the free choice to be to be to say the opposite of truth, I have the free choice to say the truth. And he always has the capability to remember and to arouse his love of the one God that is certainly undoubtedly latent in his heart. That's it. That's my three choice. I can, uh, I can, I can act in a way that I forgot God. I can act in a way that I don't remember God. I can act in a way that I don't believe in God. I can have all these acts. The Torah tells you, fine, that's free choice. But I don't think that it's very hard for a person to ultimately do what is right. And that's that's one hundred percent true. Every person has a choice in his hand to do everything the Torah says. There's nothing in the Torah and its wisdom that is not possible for a person to do. And that's why it says in the Torah, with all your heart. That means if I say that it's impossible for me to love God. Then it's essence I'm saying, I don't have the power over love. Love is not in my power. The Torah says, every Jew has the power to love. Love is an emotion that was given over to every person. You want to love, you can do it. You don't want to, no. So when a person says, I don't love God, because you don't want to, fine. It's a choice. But if I want to love, I have the capacity to love. I have the capacity to love every, anything that I want to think about, that I want to love. And that's the reality. And if I love, I have the capacity of love, so the Alter Rebbe continues. If I have the capacity of love, I have the capacity of fear. And I have the capacity of awe of God. Right? That's what we say. A kol b'day shamayim, chutz mi yir shamayim. Another expression. Everything is in the hands of God besides my Love and fear of God. That's my choice. That's my emotions. And I have the freedom to love God or not to love. The freedom to fear God or not to fear. So too, I have it between man and man. You can't force me to love you. You can put a gun to my head and say, you have to love me. I can say I love you. You're going to put a gun to my head, but I don't love you. You cannot force me to love something. Fear you could, but not love. And that's why when Exodus, we're not looking for the lower level of fear, which is easy to put a fear on anybody. That's what the rest of the world and most religions put fear on people. Oh, you're going to go to hell. God's going to strike you down. We could put fear on people easily. People are fearful. You see it in the world and around in general. We put fear on people. Everybody's afraid. We have this anxieties, etc. Why do we have all these anxieties? Because people, other people put on, don't listen to the news. We listen to the news and we get, we get fearful. We get, we get anxieties. Imagine if we didn't listen to the news. We wouldn't have anxieties. So where are all these anxieties come from people putting on us? So fear is easy. Love is harder. Much harder. And we're not looking for fear of, 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 of a fear, you know, oh, the Gehenna and fear of, of, of a retribution. Because that's easy. We're looking for awe of God. That's much harder. But that's in the, in the capacity of every human being to have a love of God and to be in awe of God, to respect God. And this also, this love carries fear. Again, the higher level of fear. This love carries awe. Because he doesn't want to separate himself. 
He's so respectful of God. He loves him. And therefore, he respects him. I respect God that I don't want to hurt somebody. Right? I can do the same thing with another person. I fear your retribution. I fear your anger. I fear your, your, what you're going to do if I'm going to hurt you. Or I respect you. I don't fear your retribution. I don't do something against you because I respect you. I'm in awe of you. And that respect comes because I love you. I want this relationship. And therefore, I love this relationship. And therefore, God forbid what I want to break it. God forbid I want to break this relationship. That's a respectful concept. I feel a bit nefesh, mamish. I'm ready to go on self sacrifice for it. Not to, for God, not to break this relationship because I love him and I'm in awe of him. That it ultimately reaches up to above my logic. I'm ready to give my life up. So therefore, I'm not, it's not a logical concept. So my love and fear, come, my love and fear, that's why the concept of motion, at least, see, that's the way a love and fear go higher than the seichel. So my love and fear comes through intellect, but ultimately through my emotions, I reach higher than intellect. That's where emotions even reach up to even greater than your intellect. I have such a love to something, I'm ready to go against my own intellect. And that was Avram Avin, that's the example of Abraham. He had such a love to God that he's ready to misnefish for the Abish. He jumped into ready to jump into a fire. Intellectually, that doesn't make any sense. But since he had such a love to the Abish, he, his, his, he went above his intellect. And that's why the Abish is looking for the heart. Because not only is God looking for the intellectual part of a human being, he's looking for ultimately the intellect to affect the heart to go even above one's intellect. Kolchkein, elabitive the divine nature. The Kolchkein b'shvidas hataiva. If I'm ready to give up my life for God, I should surely be ready to break my desires in life. Hakam yisurimis, which is much easier. It's in, it's less suffering than death. We all can agree with that. So if I'm ready to die for God, why wouldn't I be ready to give up a taiva, a desire, my personal desire? For the sake of God. It's much easier. If you think about it, it's much, if I'm ready to give my life up to God, I shouldn't be ready to give up a certain little taiva or desire that I have or wish that I have for God. I'm ready to give my life up to God. So for sure, I'm ready to give up a taiva, which is not a life situation, not a life. A taiva, uh, uh, an appetite, a delight is not a, not a life and death situation. So why can't I, why that's, that's where the moment of stupidity comes into the Jew, comes to my, I'm ready to give my life up to God, but I'm not ready to give up the certain, you know, I have a certain taiva, I like certain thing, or I like a certain way of life. You're ready to give up your life for God. How can you say you're ready to give your life up to God, but not, uh, not, not to this time? That's the same kind of relationship. It's like, I'm ready to give my life for you, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this for you. Doesn't make any sense. You're ready to give my life up to you. If you're ready to give your life up to me, so why can't you just do me a little favor? But again, we rationalize everything because really we don't love the person. When I'm not ready to give everything over to this person, I really don't love them. I might say I love them, but I re it's not true love. True love is I'm ready to take a bullet for you. I'm ready to take a bullet for you. So I'm surely ready to give up my little in inconsistencies or my little personal uh, ego for you. That's a true relationship. Hey, Mechina Sermera, which is turning away from the evil. We should all be easy to turn away from the evil. If you think about it. I feel like I've made a call, should it save even from the, even a, a minor rabbinical infraction? Because the one important thing over here is to go against the will of God. Why would any one of us who loves God and is ready to go and receive a snapfish for God and respects God want to do something against his will? And against the will of the Abish, there's no biggie or smallie. Everything is equal. And the same thing again is in a relationship. A true relationship, there's no big things and small things. Everything is important to this relationship. 
And the truth is that if anything I've done against God, anything, whether it's the thought, speech, and action, and the most minor avera that I think of, minor infraction that I think of is, is not so much against God, ultimately it is. It's a very desire. Because at that moment I'm separating, I'm breaking this relationship. I'm breaking this respect. I'm breaking the love. I'm breaking the relationship. I'm breaking the, the unity between us. I'm just, I'm basically bringing into this, into the relationship things that do not belong. And that's Ave Dezada. And that's like bowing down to a life. The Shasmaisa at the time that I'm doing this infraction, how big or small it is. But don't be worried. The Al-Tarebbe answers. The Al-Tarebbe says, ultimately, you always can do tshuva. Even if you did a Zara, you can do tshuva. You can always do tshuva. And by God, you can always do tshuva. The truth is, God says, that's like you can always do tshuva. For a big thing and a small thing, to me, you should also be able to do tshuva, repent between each other. Always forgive. And that completes the Tanya of today. Friend, today is the 25th day of the month, which is half of the chapter of 119, the first 40 letters of the, the Hebrew alphabet, from Aleph to Mem, well, 40, first 40 letters. The letters from Aleph to Mem, and you would accomplish the Tanya, the, the Chitas of the day, and I wish you all a beautiful and happy and healthy day. Emirchem, today at 10 a.m., we're going to learn together a sikh of the Rebbe. Emirchem, at 10 a.m., either at Chabad, means a sikh, a teaching of the Rebbe on the portion of the week, either at Chabad or on the Zoom number, or also on this uh, tour on Facebook, TorahDirect.com, 10 a.m. today. I wish you all a beautiful and happy, healthy day. See you for sure tomorrow at 8 a.m. We'll continue the chitas of the day.